Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Living in the Limelight, an Anton Scholl and Friends podcast where we discuss music from the artist and fan perspective. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right, thank you for joining the Living in the Limelight podcast. I'm your host, Anton Scholl, and we have a very special guest today. Mr. Dane Zimmerman is joining us from whiskey dogs and actually a lot more we're going to talk about a lot of that but right now you're with whiskey dogs and of course you own zim's guitar out in mesa so we're going to talk about that also so thank you for joining me how are you doing today Anton? thank you for having me uh it's a pleasure to be here i'm doing great doing great today good you're braving this uh, cold weather uh, the weather is, is, it's cold, but I'm expecting a lot of customers today. Saturdays is pretty much my busy day at the shop. And so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to a, uh, a great day today. I've already spent a lot of money on a lot of equipment. Oh yeah. And, and I want to talk about pro reverb amp already this morning. And you also have a, uh, a great looking squire that you just got in, didn't you? When did you, did you get, did you sell that yet? The, uh, uh, what year was that Squire that you had in? I, don't know, I saw you had a Fender Squire that I saw in there a while ago. Oh, is it something I did a video on? Yeah. Yeah. On your um, YouTube channel. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. You sell, you sell so many. You have no quick. idea. Right. Yeah, I think it's already probably sold. They, they do go quick. Well, let's talk about the store for a little bit because i you know what I would have to say okay. that, Every, as a musician, I think every musician's dream, whenever, you know, hey, we're not going to be out there touring the world, you know, so uh, every mm-hmm. musician's other dream would then be to own their own guitar store or music store. So tell me a little bit about that, how you got involved in that, and uh, then we'll talk about your, your store. Well, um, you know, pretty much throughout my life, I've always been the kind of guy that would, um, flip i've always been in a band and i've played bass but i've also done some punk rock stuff where i was the guitar player so i had a band called the fed ups and Mm -hmm. um and so i'd play guitar in that but i was always the kind of guy just to make a um, a show interesting i would buy a guitar at a pawn shop for 60 bucks or something and i'd restring it and then i would take it to that gig and then i'd flip it so i've always been the guy that would uh flip guitars and buy something new just for the adventure of it. And um, mm-hmm. it's a it's a good thing because it adds a variety to every time you get on stage, you're playing a different guitar and you it's kind of cool. But then sure. on the flip side of thing, you're you're never comfortable on your guitar. Like a lot of guys have their number one guitar and they're super comfortable on that. For years, I was never comfortable on my guitar. I'd be like halfway through the show, I'm like, oh, man, I'm... <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Here we go. You know, and I was never really, yeah. So there's good and bad things about doing that, but it kept it exciting. You never found that so, one uh, bass or one guitar that was like, that was, I you. have one now. Yeah. No, after years and years of, of, of making that mistake, I finally, uh, I finally picked out a uh, Mexican P bass that I play oh. pretty much at every show. And, oh, okay. and it, it was beat up. So I, I'm, I bought like 30 bass guitars from the same guy down in Maricopa, down South of Maricopa. Mm. And I just loaded them all in the back of my truck. They didn't have gig bags or anything. I just p- piled all these bass guitars covered in dust from being down South of Maricopa there. And wow. uh, the guy was having health issues. And I'm like, well, no wonder, dude, it's so dusty down here. And the bases were just covered in dust. But one of them was a... Uh, a black label, mid nineties, Mexican P bass, precision bass mm-hmm. It's all dented up and just really ugly. But the, the fret, the fretboard was good. The, the neck was nice on it. And so I probably had about 60 bucks into that bass after doing the math and adding them all up and, you know, 1800 bucks for 30 bases or whatever I spent. And so I just took a black uh, spray can and I rattle canned the uh, pick guard 
And then I put a big old Jack Daniels logo over the pick guard. And then there it is. The bass is all done. And that's my number one bass that I play now. And even in the studio, uh, <clears throat> when I take it into the studio, the guys are always like, oh, dude, that bass sounds great. And so I have no complaints on that bass. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I play a $60 made in Mexico bass. That's awesome. You know, not, not everybody, you know, not everyone needs to have. There's a, this status symbol thing that a lot of people look at that if it's I'm not playing a Gibson guitar or an Alembic bass or, you know, a Rickenbacker or something like that, that, you know, it's not cool. But I got to tell you, playing some of these basses where you can uh, make it yourself or you can modify it to be you, then that's really all that matters. So, you know, mm -hmm. kudos to you for doing that. that that's great. Well, I've got a, like an 80s Jackson made in USA, neck through red, beautiful Jackson bass. And I think um, if you went on Reverb or somewhere, eBay and tried to sell it or look at, you know, comparable listings, you know, mm -hmm. on reverb, it's like a $2,300 base and that wow. thing stays at home. Yeah. Right. So I don't even, Good. I don't even really play it because it's got too much paint on the back of the neck and mm -hmm. it's just, you know, maybe someday I'll get used to it, but now I'm sticking to uh, being comfortable on a base and just, you know, I got the yeah. one that I like and yeah. Well, so and people when they see this are like, dude, where'd you get that base? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, it's just, yeah, I put a sticker oh, on sure. it, man. It's no big deal. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Well, um, let's talk about your inventory because uh, I did see a couple of videos of yours where you buy or you had bought some storage lockers. Right. So how does that, how does that go about? Tell me about that. Well, that's kind of a sad story, but, uh, you know, basically what it comes down to is old guys collect guitars and then they pass away. Mm. And so it's up to their wives or their sisters or whatever to, you know, finally sell the collection. So every once in a while the phone does ring and it's like, Hey man, I got this. My dead husband has all these guitars, but on, on the storage locker mm. video that I did back in May, um, I put up a video and it, and it pretty much went viral. Right now it's at about 670,000 views Nice on my channel. And my channel is Zim's Guitars on YouTube. Zim's with a Z. But um, I knew the guy, he was a customer of mine. And his name was Joey. And Joey uh, was an awesome guitar player. And he even did a Sister Sledge album. But he, he, was a, he was a big player here in Phoenix for his whole life. And, uh, when, and he came into my store all the time at my old location. And he would kind of brag about his storage lockers. And I'm like, well, Joey, dude, take me to, let me look through your lockers, dude. I'll buy stuff from you. Let me, you know, and this is when, you know, like five years ago when I sort of needed more inventory. Right now I'm stuffed with inventory. But five years ago, I was like, Joey, take me over there, man. Let's go look. And he was like, well, maybe maybe one day I'll, I'll take you and we'll go look through them. But he ended up passing away. Mm. And uh, it was very sad and tragic. And because he, he was a good customer and he had turned into a good friend. And then uh, after he passed away, you know, his cousin let me know about it and everything. And then his sister... Uh, called me about 18 months later and she's like, I own Joey's lockers now. He had three of them and I own Joey's mm. lockers now. And do you want to buy his lockers? And I'm like, yeah, I want to buy his lockers. And so mm. I bought the first locker and I didn't do a video about it, but the second locker, I decided to do that video. And so I just, you know, I, I wrote her a check and uh, we went up and we looked into the locker and then I saw like a Mesa Boogie cabinet in there and everything. So I wrote her a check and she said, okay, have a great time because it was jam packed full of trash, but it also had great gear inside there. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and it, it took me like two weeks to clean this locker out. I had to make not like nine trips to the trash dump or the, you know, my, uh, my big trash can out behind my store. Right. Sure. And, and, uh, I had to make two trips to, um, 
the goodwill because he had suits and all his clothing I donated. But a lot of, and I ended up getting a lot of old records and some cool stuff like that out of there too. But the video got so many views. It really, it really um, helped me uh, grow the channel. And I've ended up getting probably like 10,000 new subscribers from it because it's every day it's still getting, you know, it's like averaging like 100 or 150 views every hour on YouTube currently as we speak right now. It's probably had a hundred views this morning, every hour, it gets like a hundred, 150. And I, uh, kind of thought, and I honestly, when I made the video, I was hoping for like maybe 3000 views. Cause a lot of my videos have, is just basically me restringing a used guitar or shining up a used guitar, or maybe changing a pickup out or something. Cause I'm basically a restring channel. When you buy a used guitar at the guitar shop here, I always shine them up. I always restring them. I always polish the frets. I always check the electronics and I try to make them good playing. You know, I do a setup on them. And so I do YouTube videos on that. So I was well, hoping yeah. for, yeah, yeah. So Not a lot part of, people of my do job that. anyhow, I can make a video out of it anyhow. Right. So it's a little bonus how long, on top. How long have you had the, st the store open for? I opened my store in the summer of 2016. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let everybody it, know I where it about, is. Uh, when I first started in 2016, I had like 40 guitars and I had like five grand in the bank. Mm -hmm. And I got super lucky because this, um, this um, little strip mall was pretty much, um, it was in foreclosure. And the guy gave me a one-year lease on the spot. And my rent was really affordable. So that helped me grow. And uh, there used to be a guitar shop in town, a music store, Musician's Discount. Do you remember Musician's Discount in Mesa? No, no. Yeah, because you're a North Phoenix guy, right? Right, I'm a North, you're yeah. a North Phoenix all the time, yeah. But I tried to model my store after Musician's Discount, except I just wanted to do guitars and amps and pedals. I didn't do PA gear. I don't want to get into drum sets. I don't want to get into uh, recording equipment or anything like that. I just mm -hmm. did guitars, amps and pedals. And because that's the kind of stuff that I know, right? Sure. Oh yeah. And so I didn't want to buy an old bunch of old power amps or, you know, rec old school recording gear that's outdated. Every year your recording equipment gets outdated. So I didn't want to oh, yeah. mess with any of that. But a good used guitar, they hold their value really well. So you can have a 20 or a 30 year old guitar. How are you doing, man? You could have a 20 or 30 year old guitar that you paid, you know, you know, back in 1990 if you paid 300 or 400 bucks for it, it's almost still worth three or 400 bucks, you sure. know, 33 years later. Yeah. So, and that's why people still guitars because they hold their value really well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so that's sort mm -hmm. of good. Yeah, so where's your store at? Where, guitar. where can, where can people right find now, your store? Right now, my store is on the corner of Alma School and Guadalupe in Mesa, Arizona. Okay. Yeah. All so right. There's well, good. US now let's talk about the Alma School. Okay. Alma School. Okay. Let's talk Alma about the. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the the bands, the music. I was really interested okay. in the Fed Up. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about that because one, obviously, the name. Uh, and two, it was really more of a punk band. And, That's right. Right. So how did that get mm -hmm. formed and started? And how did you, what does the name mean? Well, it kind of goes back even further than the Fed Ups. I was, my first punk band was called Blemish. And that was with my now ex-wife. But my, my uh, wife at the time, back about in the year, maybe 1999 or 2000 or somewhere around there, she wanted to become the singer and she wanted to be a singer. And I'd always had bands together and she was really talented and um, she wrote great poems. So I could take one of her poems and I could put 
music to it really quickly and and we wrote really good songs together but then when we got divorced i needed an outlet you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying and as a way to heal i put together with with my new girlfriend that i got you know a few months later and mm -hmm. she was a drummer she wanted to be a drummer so me and the new girlfriend put a, a punk band together that was just helping me with all my uh the angst that i had be because of this divorce and so i would it was all relationship songs and uh and aggressive and i would play my guitar and i would just scream my guts out in every song and most of the songs and i ended up with like three full-length albums pretty much all about the ex-wife ah. and but it helped me work my way through all that you know what i'm sure. saying yeah and so that's where the fed ups came from mm. and uh we're we're still basically the band is uh basically we're still sort of together but we're kind of like on hiatus it's oh, okay. it's tough at my age to scream for a half an hour or 45 minutes you know? I get that. So I got to yeah. be in the right That's, mood to want to do that. To sure. That band and go play. Definitely understood. Um, yeah. So what was your process in the song writing? I know you were saying that obviously the relationships were kind of the catalysts for those songs. But when yeah. you're doing a song, is it music first, lyrics, melody? What is your process in physical writing? It's both way both ways i can set and write a guitar riff and then try to come up with lyrics based on a guitar riff or mm -hmm. there's been times where i'll take a piece of paper and a, and a pencil and i will write down lyrics and um and so there's two different ways of doing it and i've done it both ways and now, what now what happens though for me is if you write a guitar riff and then you put lyrics to the riff the song is a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. and you have to get lyrics that fit in onto over a guitar riff. If I would just write a poem out and then sing the poem, that would usually be something that was like a three chord song that was very easy. So, yeah. So when you write mm -hmm. a song that has a riff, mm -hmm. it's usually a little bit more of a complicated song. Mm -hmm. Now you for, did the vocal. So you were the vocalist in fat in the fed ups. You're you're the vocalist mm -hmm. and guitar player. Yes. And, and there then, were a lot of times where I had a fourth guy in the band. There were times where we'd go out and play as a three piece. And then there I had two or three buddies of mine that would set in and play lead guitar. So there uh, honestly, the fed ups has probably had about 10 different members in the band. And there's the I even had two drummers because I had a West Side drummer. And I had an East side drummer. <laughs> so if nice. I had a gig on a Tuesday night, you know, I tried to make it fun for the musicians in the band. And so mm -hmm. if I had a gig on a Tuesday night out on the West side of town, I would get Philip Barber to play the show because he lived out on the West side of town. And if I had a gig on uh, on a weekend over on the East side of town, I'd get Woody Cohen to be the drummer and, uh, Okay. to make it easy on the guys because i never wanted to you know it was something you have to do for fun you know yeah so we had to do right. it for fun that was the best way to do it okay so now we transition into the whiskey dogs the whiskey dogs have actually mm -hmm. been around for quite mm -hmm. some time now you just brought up woody uh mm -hmm. so let's talk about the whiskey dogs because back when okay you, you've obviously transitioned through uh, different guitar players and yeah. uh, you know, you, you were just a cover band in the beginning, but now you've really expanded out there, have some great originals and right. uh, even, you know, and now your Thank songs you. are even, you know, the soundtracks of, of, you know, certain series. So let's talk about that. Now that goes way back. So let's talk about the whiskey dogs for a bit. Okay. Well, we started in, in 2006 and uh it was basically it was slammer and star were the uh, the lead singer and the lead guitar player and those guys already sort of had their band but when they brought me in i was at, on bass i was able to um help them find a drummer and i was able to actually 
get enough rehearsal in with them where they could go and do a three and a half or four hour show. Yeah. Um, up, usually we would play at the bar, the bar scene in Scottsdale. So we'd do all the biker bars. We were a biker bar band. Mm -hmm. So um, we definitely had to play Born to be Wild and a bunch of times, almost every gig, you know? Right. And um, Slammer was never the kind of guitar, great guitar player, but he never wanted to um, write originals. And so the first mm -hmm. original that we wrote, uh, me and me and Star, the lead singer, wrote a song called Rock Hard. And um, and um, because all the Fed Up songs were all original songs, uh, you know, I've written a lot of originals, but me and Star finally wrote a tune and it was called Rock Hard. And it would start, and I'm like, um, and I was to write that song. I'm, I was said, Star, just sing the first line of the song to me. And he started singing, la da 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 da. He started singing it, and I took my guitar or I my bass, and I matched up the chords behind what was already coming out of his brain, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, and so it ended up being to it ended up being a D chord down to a G chord and back to a D chord and then down to a G chord. And that's what star was singing. So that's what we, how we wrote the song. Hmm. And then okay. slammer heard it and he's like, dude, that's not a song. That's a D chord down to a G chord, back to a D chord down to a chord. I'm like, dude, no, that that's a song. That's a song. You can think yeah. of it like it's just two chords, but you also have to think of this. Is that how you have to write a song is you have to start with using a chord, right? Or a right. riff. And so Slammer just didn't really get it and wasn't really into the whole idea of doing originals. He was happy mm -hmm. playing in his cover band and he still is doing a great job there in Scarlet Fever. Yeah. So Scarlet Fever is playing all over town. I have nothing bad to say about Slammer. I love him as a brother, but he didn't want to do original stuff and he didn't yeah. want to travel to LA and play at the whiskey and stuff. We took him out there one time but he w wasn't up for it. But I, I love Slammer with all my heart. He's a great guy. He comes in the store. He bought a, he bought a really USA, uh, really nice USA Fender Strat from me a few mm -hmm. months back. And yeah, we're good friends. Good. So I highly recommend you can go and see Slammer's band. They're called Scarlet Fever. Him and his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah great band. Great band. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So then you transitioned into another guitar player. Yeah, uh, we got a girl. Her name is Jane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jane only wanted to do originals. And she came from San Francisco. And she was into the 80s thrash. Yeah, And we were like, Jane, we, we, we can't play like, we can't play thrash like that. I mean, we can try to get heavy. We can do what we can do. But we're not going to sound like Slayer. Okay? We're, we're just, we've never played that kind of stuff we don't have that i can't play bass that fast you know we had our reasons that yeah. you know, she wanted to be super heavy and we just couldn't get there so she tried to mold to us she tried to cater to what us old guys could do and so she had to really dial down what she wanted to do with an original band and we had to really dial up to to get to her mm. level of her playing yeah. and so it, it worked for a couple of years but then um, finally, all the trips to LA that we make all the time and all that kind of stuff was just too much for her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'd play the Marquee Theater a couple of times. We'd play the Whiskey A Go Go a couple of times with Jane. But it ended up in COVID in the middle of it all. And so it was just too much for her. So, so yeah. we ended up getting Michael Nitro as our lead guitar player now. And how did that go about? Because Michael Nitro is, I mean, on his own, uh, you know, he has his originals. The guy's jammed with Sammy Hagar. He's done a, he's done right. so much in music and for music. He's even, he's even uh, toured out of the country and, right. you know, he's so very how... accomplished and, and right. he's very accomplished. He's great friends with Danny Zalesko of, yeah. you know, Danny Zalesko presents. So sure. There's been dozens of times where he's got to open up for some of the greatest bands in the world at Celebrity Theater and the Rialto Theater. And just last month, he opened up and, and did an acoustic set um, opening for Blue Oyster Cult at the Rialto. And that was just like mm -hmm. two weeks ago or something. 
So he's very accomplished and, and we're, uh, we're really privileged to, to have him in the band. And sometimes I say to myself, holy crap, dude, I, I'm writing songs with Michael Nitro now. Yeah. And we're having a great time doing it. And so I'm like, holy shit, I can't believe that I'm going to Nitro's house to write a song on, on a guitar riff that I can't have up in my brain, you know? Yeah. And we're doing really good writing songs. We've got 12 original songs now. And we've got mm. we've got three or four in in the in the frying pan cooking it up you know what i'm saying we got three or four song ideas that we're working on and we're in the studio right now we're in a we're in the best studio i don't i'm coming off like i'm bragging but we really are in the best studio in this whole town right now recording um our first album and who's engineering and turning out great you have an engineer on the uh, on the album Who's, who's producing? We do. Um, we're out at we're out at Platinum Underground Studios in Mesa, and um, John Acalino is our producer engineer. And uh, if you um, old Icon fans from the '80s remember Icon, uh, they did two albums on Capitol Records in '84 and. 86 and then they had another record they had a couple record deals in the 80s they made two or three great albums and dan wexler and john acalino are the guitar players from icon and um sold a ton of records on capital records so yeah so john acalino mm -hmm. from icon is our uh engineer and producer okay and you also and had a couple again, of your songs you had a couple of your songs yeah. uh, put out uh, on. Uh, you have, do you have you have them on Mayans, the TV series or the series? And um, that's right, and and that's because of our our lead singer, the Starfields. Yeah, and so Star is a uh, he works in Hollywood, and he has pretty much for like thirty years now. And so Star um, is a construction manager. So when when he's working on the sons of anarchy show or he went and he worked on um the mayans which is that mayans. motorcycle show on fx mm -hmm. right now he's on the fox lot um working on 911 mm -hmm. and so uh he's got all these la connections and so uh one of his good friends sean mcnab who was the bass player on quiet riot 3 album and Sean McNabb has also oh. been in Dawkins and the Lynch Mob, and uh, he's done some stuff with Paul Sortino, and he's just a very accomplished uh, bass player in L.A. Uh, he he just currently made a movie, believe it or not, because all musicians mm -hmm. want to be movie stars and actors, mm -hmm. and actors want to be musicians, and it's kind of a <laughs> right. thing where we all sort of kind of, you know, do whatever we can do, right? Right. And so Sean McNabb has recently made a movie and it's going to be coming out pretty soon, but it's out it at film festivals right now. And the name of the movie is called The uh, Road to um oh what's it called? Road Road to Zaletto, I think it's called. And so okay. it's out at film festivals right now and it's actually going to be at the Chandler Film Festival on Saturday the 27th. So I think in 2 weeks from today it's at the chandler film festival but at uh, but the soundtrack we have two songs on the soundtrack for that movie because again it's it's who who you know basically right sure and because our singer well the music's knows, also uh, good let's not yeah the music know, is very it's, good it's we'll about get... who you know you, you, you yeah. know it's about who you get know. it there sure yeah i get it <laughs> and so uh so we, there's two songs on the soundtrack and, and also there's a, it's a really good soundtrack. A Gilby Clark has a song on there and there's some other uh, uh, pretty impressive bands that are on the soundtrack, but at the New York film festival, it won best soundtrack. So it's actually, nice. yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it won an award at the New yeah, York. I saw film that festival. posted. Yeah. That it's was amazing, posted on isn't Facebook. it? Yeah. Yeah. 
That's that. That's great. And I tell you, it's funny because you see, like, if if whoever watches uh, uh, Mayans or if uh, they're in the Sons of Anarchy, every yeah. once in a while, you'll see Star in the background. You'll when they have all that's of true. the bikers in the background, you'll see Star. That's true. I remember seeing. Yeah. 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 He looks like a big old biker dude. He's got long black hair and he's all yeah. tatted up. So he fits right, right. in. Right. Yeah. So that's great. That's great. So we've, I've got to ask you a couple of questions, just, just kind of fun uh, for the podcast, since we got through all of your bands and everything that you're doing in the guitar store. I want to ask you a couple of quick uh, questions about just music in general, which would be if you, okay. Uh, let's, let's say you, you were going to start a band and you wanted an ideal band. Okay. Now you can pick anybody in this band to be in your band dead or alive. Who would be, who would be Dane's band? I can't, I have no idea. I really honestly so have. Oh, okay. Well, who'd you have on? I drums? would have liked to have been Michael Anthony. If it was 1980 oh, or no, 1978 and I could have lived in Pasadena and mm -hmm. and played bass instead of Michael Anthony playing bass, if it could have been me, I sort of could have back in when I was very young, I could sing like that. I can't sing high like that anymore, but I, no, I'd like to, I'd like to take over for Michael Anthony and, and I would have loved to have been in Van Halen, the first, the first Van Halen. Okay. So if you were the Roth putting Van Halen. If you were That'd putting a band, band together, right yeah, well, yeah, right now. But if you were putting a band together yourself, who would you have as your ideal members? Would you have Michael Anthony on the bass? Who would you have on drums? Who would you have on guitar? I, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Um, <laughs> Tough question. Yeah, you know what would be tons of fun to do, though? is to go on one of those monsters of rock cruises or one of those the oh, cruise yeah. ship that has all the rock stars and there's like 50 bands on there yeah and i would like to uh because <coughs> i got i have to kind of know if i like people and if i could work well with them and if what they thought about me and stuff like that yeah. so i wouldn't want to just pick uh noodle bent and court and i wouldn't want to just pick ingve yeah i'll be ingve's bass player yeah i have to be sort of right. realistic about this you know sure so i would course, love to be on the monsters of rock cruise mm. and i would love to have my bass with me there and i would love to um I would love to be, and when when they have the open mic sort of blues jam kind of free for all jams, where all the other guys from Black and Blue and Y and T and all the guys that are on the Joe Satriani and Great White, all the guys that are in the uh, Robbie Lochner, who's in uh, Great White, he's a great guy. Okay. But I would like to be in where they have the open jam on the cruise ship and just be able to play Sin City or a whole lot of Rosie oh, yeah. and just have, you know, all those dudes right. just hanging around and seeing who that I can kind of gel with. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking the time to be on here. We, uh, you know, we, we, we will continue this. I'd love to have you back on again. I appreciate you taking the time to join. Uh, and again, uh, give the out, give out the information of where people could find you as far as the guitar store and also any, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube channels that they should go on to, to subscribe to. My YouTube channel is Zim's guitars on YouTube. Z I M M S. As soon as you search Zim's, it comes right up. Okay. So luckily there aren't any other Zim's guitars stuff that when you, when you search for it, it comes right up. And my store is in Mesa, Arizona. It's on the corner of Alma school and Guadalupe in the Safeway Plaza. And I'm down here six days a week. If you want to come in and chat and buy a t-shirt, I have Zim's guitar t-shirts that are available, but, uh, and, uh, next whiskey dogs show is, um, First week of April, I think it's April 6th. We're opening for Ron Keel at uh, the Whiskey A Go Go on April 6th. So that's our next show that we have in the books right now. But we'll probably end up with something before then. But um, yeah, sure. that's where you can find me. 
All right. Well, I appreciate again you taking the time for this. And uh, we will certainly talk again soon. Thank you very much. Okay, Anton. Thank you very much. You got it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Tune in each week to Living in the Limelight podcast, and we will see you then. Thank you. Thank you for joining our Living in the Limelight podcast with your host, Anton Scholl. Please feel free to comment, like, follow, share, and subscribe. And also, add us to your playlist on your favorite streaming sites. Thanks again for joining, and we'll talk to you again next week.